Tentpole franchises are a crucial aspect of major media publications. In order to keep up and running and to help fund their weirder, less accessible games, movies, or television shows that further push creative talents to their staff or hired departments. No major games publisher knows this and uses it to their strengths more than Ubisoft, who have built themselves a hammock from their two tentpole franchises, Far Cry and Assassin's Creed, with Watch Dogs looking like it'll become the third in a series of major properties to help fund their more indie-like games, such as Rayman, Child of Light, and Grow Home. The reason I bring this up is because I've recently played Far Cry 5, the sixth in a long-running series, and it got me thinking. Since it's so crucial to Ubisoft's success as a company, it needs to make certain concessions for mass marketing appeal, or else it runs the risk of alienating a mainstream audience and becoming a commercial and financial bomb to Ubisoft and scaring off shareholders. So with all that in mind, is it fair to criticize Far Cry 5, or for that matter major tentpole games like you would any other? Is it fair to discredit samey open world design knowing what's at stake? This is the major issue I've been having in putting together my critique of this latest in a long line of the behemoth of a franchise. So as I go along with this video, I'll be making references to what works and what doesn't, all while keeping in mind the loops the designers had to weave their way through in order to appease shareholders and more importantly, the mainstream audience. Far Cry as a series is one I've been a pretty big fan of since playing 2 for the first time back in 2008, when it first released. It felt like someone took what made games like Half-Life and Halo so fun, but then gave it a grounded, real-world feeling and expanded the scope significantly. It certainly wasn't the first open-world game by a long stretch, but to me, it was the best and still retains that title, only recently being challenged 9 years later by Nintendo's latest Zelda outing, Breath of the Wild. With the release of Far Cry 3, Ubisoft found the perfect mainstream formula and really ran with it, using it for their follow-ups 4 and Primal. And if you'd like a deeper look at this evolution, I've done a full series analysis, so check that out now or after this if you'd like. When trailers for 5 started circulating, long-running fans of the grittier, pre-perfected formula Far Cry 2 like myself got our hopes up that Ubisoft decided to go back to their roots of this series. Stripping back the need of a constant on-screen minimap, bringing back partners, and generally taking away the linearity that began to encroach the open worlds of 3, 4, and Primal. To an extent, 5 delivers on that promise, but at the cost of what those later titles managed to get right. It's a confused middle ground. For the sake of being thorough though, I will say I played on a first generation PS4 since my PC isn't good enough to run the game on high enough settings to record, so if you're looking for graphical or performance stats, you won't find them here. But the PS4 held a solid 30 FPS with no noteworthy dips. I also won't be touching on the Far Cry arcade or diving too deep into the story, so while there's some spoilers present, there won't be any story ones, just some moments from later in the game, so watch at your own discretion if you're sensitive to that kind of thing. I also didn't touch the co-op mode because I don't have any friends who own a PS4 so I'm leaving that out too. This is strictly a look at how the core game has evolved from Primal to 5. Far Cry 5 opens in typical Far Cry fashion. A long droning intro that has minimal gameplay but tense story moments, introducing the setting and stories in a way players are forced to pay attention to so as not to miss what you're actually fighting for. My main issue with these parts is they don't paint a picture of what the gameplay will be like, it just consists of a lot of walking and pressing circle to escape in parts. When you're set free, there's a sense of whiplash from how differently this almost walking simulator like section is to the rest. You don't want players wandering too far off the beaten path and missing that story writer spent so long working on, but Far Cry has this habit of making the story seem at odds with its gameplay. In Far Cry 3, you're a lost teenager who needs to save his friends, and then after the intro suddenly becomes a one man killing machine. 5 suffers from the same issue but less so. You're made out to be the newcomer cop, even so far as to being referred to as Rook by your peers. Oh, oh Jesus Christ, Rook, I'm sorry. So the fact you become a similarly one person army is equally disconnected. It's not the biggest deal by any means, just a bit weird. After creating your avatar, you're good to go into the tutorial mission, but hang on a second, character creation? That's new? This feels like a bit of a callback to 2, where you chose which character to play as from a pre-created list, but now you lose that fun backstory and can minimally choose their outfits and looks. I don't think this was a bad idea in theory, it just has a lot of lost potential. Considering how far character customization has become with modern gaming, the lack of options is just disappointing in the end. The real issue I came across with the system is playing as a female character. She got referred to as male in key pre-rendered cutscenes. Both know better! What was I supposed to do? Leave him to die! Damn it. To me, this shows a lack of polish and acts as a major oversight to the overall production of the game. Personally, this wasn't anything major past some immersion breaking, but as someone looking for representation, I can see how it would be a letdown. On top of this, having a silent protagonist loses the punch and weight that Jason or RJ had with their inputs to story beat, meaning you're only ever rook or deputy depending on who you're talking to. 
it doesn't have the same impact when a villain is breathing down your neck trying to be intimidating. When Pagan Min was calling RJ, it had a personal weight to it. But when the father just calls you deputy, there's no feeling there. Just the reminder that you're a silent avatar. Once the opening sequence plays out, you're rescued by this guy Dutch and taken back to his little island I guess he named Dutch's Island. This first little area is the perfect microcosm of Hope County as a whole. Here you're introduced to liberating outposts, saving civilians, recruiting guns for hire, and destroying cult property. Most of the big important things you'll need to be doing in order to take down the father, Joseph Seed, and his three siblings, John, Jacob, and Faith. But there is one more, majorly important part of Dutch's Island I'd like to touch on. When Assassin's Creed released in 2007, Ubisoft found the perfect map unveiling tool with towers. Climbing a tower as Altair, having a wide view of the surrounding world and taking it all in, then adding it to your map, marking off key locations to be discovered later if you'd so like. This feature became so ingrained in the open world vocabulary that other companies started adapting it themselves, to the point of exhaustion for the genre. This staple became too ingrained within Ubisoft's extended universe, despite later adding to them more intricate puzzles to try and break the monotony, but in the long run, the reward was just not worth the travel. Simply showing off exactly where things were ruined what Discovery should be. It's with that that Far Cry 5 really surprised me. One of the first missions you undertake after the introduction to Hope County is that you're instructed to climb a tower. My immediate reaction was immense disappointment. Oh good, more of the same, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised. As you climb the tower though, Dutch says over your earpiece. I know what you're thinking, and no. I ain't gonna have you climbing towers all over the county for me, so don't worry. This is one of the greatest bait and switches I've experienced within a franchise. The relief that swept over me was almost palpable, and this wasn't just a half assed removal of a core mechanic either. Real thought and consideration was put into how to remove these towers and what to put in their place instead. In the previous three major games, climbing a tower offered up two main different things, a mini puzzle to get to the top, and then unlocking what inhabits the surrounding area. As a result, the removal of these two things was split apart and turned into their own, very separate elements. The first is Pepper Stashes a series of puzzling challenges hidden all around Hope County. Using your wit and problem solving skills, you must figure out how to get into each different kinds of areas, from garages to hangars to underground bunkers. And at the end, you'll often find sums of money, points to put into perk trees, and sometimes unlocking different kinds of vehicles to add to your collection. This takes the best part of those old towers and gives them more of a defined purpose with a better sense of rewarding players for their efforts. So then how do you replace showing off key points of interest to players if towers have been removed from Ubisoft's toolbox? The answer is incredibly simple and surprisingly elegant, scattered all around are different kinds of books and maps. Some of these will reveal hunting locations, fishing spots, and properties within the area surrounding their pickup. It's a nice way to encourage players to search their surroundings to scavenge anything they find. It is a shame that by default these handy little notes are pointed out on screen ruining the fun a little bit, but hey, it's one of those minor concessions that needed to be made for accessibility. And as before, like this and most other HUD elements can be turned off is a nice touch. Actually, this is a trend in mainstream gaming I've noticed more and more, that busy and cluttered displays can be tailored to suit player preference and skill level, which is something I can absolutely get behind. After learning the ropes with Dutch and his little island, you're given the rundown on the three siblings and their different areas. This is the meat of the game, saving Hope County from the clutches of the cult. This presentation leads players to believe the game can be tackled in any order, and while this is technically true, there is an intended order here, but it's a little confused. Let me explain. Jacob's area, the White Tower Mountains to the north, is by far the easiest of the three. Requiring less resistance points, the progression currency needed to liberate each area, a mere 10,000 to the other two's 13,000. Missions are a lot shorter, and even without the extra points gained from destroying cult property, something I didn't actually do in Jacob's area, it's a quick grind to the end goal. This intended path isn't a bad thing. Even some of the least linear open world affairs have some gentle pushes in the right direction. It's just the direction you're pushed into is John's area, Holland Valley, which is what I think was originally intended as the middle area of the three. My theory on this is once it was time to start pushing the promotional material, the three specialists that were shown off, Grace, Boomer, and Nick, are all rescued from the clutches of John and they were deemed the most interesting, so at the risk of losing the attention of those more casual players, you're sent off to see them as quick as you can. What pushes this further is how shoehorn the immediate cutscene that plays after Dutch's region rundown is. Staring out into the expanse of fog and trees, Dutch says you need to watch this, and a TV screen magically appears showing off one of your friends that you lose to the cult is in serious trouble. Maybe I'm thinking too hard about this, but the fact this cutscene is played so straight from a TV screen that you absolutely have no access to, and Jacob or Faith's regions don't have any introductory cutscenes, makes me feel like this was a very last minute addition after the marketing began to circulate. Of course, you can just ignore this, but given as how the dog, Boomer, is so close to where you finish up Dutch's Island, it's a hard calling to resist. Faith's area, Henbane River, is by far the hardest and most disjointed. 
It offered a much needed variety in terms of its mission types, revolving more around stopping drug production than just straight up shooting sections, although there is a lot of that too. The drug crazed enemies felt like it was a way to have some zombie horror without actually having zombies, even to the point where you're told to shoot them in the head. It's an old trope, but it's dumb fun. The big part of what halted my progress in Henbane River and really highlighted the intended path to me was the mission Clinical Study. This mission requires you to kill and skin three bears, specifically grizzly bears. No grizzlies are found anywhere in Henbane River, they're only in Whitetail Mountains, Jacob's area. For me, it rendered the mission impossible to finish. Not wanting to trudge my way through a whole new zone and guess my way into where to find these bears, I ended up by just grinding little things like destroying property, killing cult VIPs, and saving civilians until I was finished. This felt like an unnecessary punishment for not following an order I didn't know existed, really dragging out my playtime to an unnecessary degree. Most egregious in each area is how it likes to stop progress dead in your tracks to force some exposition in your face. As you go through gaining resistance points, you'll hit two smaller milestones first. The sibling whose region you're invading will drop into your earpiece and then a prompt will pop up. These are called different things depending on where you are but are all mostly the same. Once the prompt appears and the musical sting hits, there is nothing you can do. Some soldiers will come and hunt you down, or in Henbane River, Faith will appear herself and rip you straight from whatever you're doing to monologue to the player, followed then by playing their specific missions. This is one way to make sure players don't miss the story, but since it's forced, it's hard to care or connect with what's happening. Faith revolves around the drug Bliss and walking through some dreamlike sequences. Jacob has a mind control music box and in order to escape, you must run a timed gauntlet, racking up kills to extend the time limit. And John traps you underground where you must fight your way out. After completing each one, you wake up a long way from where you were abducted. And then you can go back to what you were doing. The very first time this happened, it was exciting. It took me by surprise and I didn't know what was happening. But the novelty was already gone the second time around once you knew when to anticipate it by hitting the little dots on the resistance bar. The fear was long gone, instead replaced by a small sense of dread for knowing I'll soon be taken away. Watching a friend play this, I saw he was in the middle of liberating an outpost in the Whitetail Mountains, which meant Jacob sends long-range archers that can shoot you out of seemingly nowhere. The small act of killing a cult VIP was enough to push him over the threshold, where he was then captured by an unseen force right in the middle of doing something. Once the anticipation is there, you have to plan what you do around your progress bars, putting a bit of a damper on the whole, do what you want when you want, lest the game rips you right out of the middle of doing something else. Upon reaching the second milestone in each area, the siblings become to know just how much of a threat you are. They send a plane down to hunt you consistently throughout the rest of your time in each place. As like before, the first time this happened, it was tense and unnerving. A plane is hunting you down, actively trying to halt your progress. But it quickly dawned on me that I had unlocked the specialist Nick, who flies a plane. So I could just set him on any flyers coming my way. When I hit that point in the second area, I was excited to see what I could be hunted down by. Since it was Henbane River, I kind of hoped it'd be a horde of fake zombies or something. A little bit ridiculous to expect, but I just wanted something that wasn't another plane. And unfortunately it was. Using the same big hunter thing over and over again three times gets a bit tiresome, and again, easy to predict and know how to take care of. At the climax of each area's story, after killing the sibling in charge and liberating people from their hideouts, an escape sequence begins to play out. As chaos reigns around you, you're instructed to destroy computers or blow up bliss to cripple the cult's impact in Hope County. Escape sequences are nothing new to games. Metroid has been doing them since the beginning, and even newer games like Ori and the Blind Forest utilizes them to cap off each dungeon. What makes escape sequences tense and actually work in these two cases is their time limits. Although Ori doesn't have a countdown, there is always an impending threat that will kill you and make you restart. Far Cry 5 has no such thing, except the obvious getting killed by cult soldiers, but it's not something fresh to get you pumped up, and considering how easy combat is in this game, it's hardly tense. As every building around you explodes and crumbles, there is no urgency to escape. It can be done in your own time, dampening a lot of fun and desperation that could have been gained. At the core of what's found in each area is fundamentally post Far Cry 3. Outposts to liberate, animals to hunt, and plants to gather. I want to go through each of these on their own, and since outposts haven't been changed too dramatically, let's start there. As I said in my problems with Far Cry video, outposts are the series' strongest point. They can be approached how you see fit, either stealth or guns blazing. Although stealth is preferred since alarms can be raised and reinforcements called in. Using the series staple binoculars to scout out enemy locations, types, and where alarms are never gets old as you spend time meticulously planning your route, only for it to fall apart by some unseen person or a missed bullet. My biggest issue when it comes to scouting is just how easy it can be to route a course once enemies have been tagged. All the info you need is given, from enemy type to being able to see them through walls, as if Widowmaker had just used her ultimate. This has been a consistent mainstay since 3 with the binoculars. The time Ubisoft decided to take Far Cry to the mainstream blockbuster level. The little difference here is that instead of just being shadowy silhouettes, they're outlined in this very obvious red glow. 
But as always, this feature can be turned off and it's a huge compliment to the design that you can still go through a little more cautiously without being detected and with no alarms, without the aid. It's just a bit odd that it's the default setting to have on, as opposed to say, being an option that becomes available after a series of deaths in one spot, similar to the Metal Gear Solid 5 chicken hat. On the flip side, managing to pull off a perfect run of rock throws, takedowns and alarm disables is immensely satisfying each and every time, more so on your own without some slightly obnoxious red lines. What's new is what comes after liberation. Previously, your reward was a new place to fast travel to, maybe a gun shop and some side quests to pursue if you so wish. Now, all of this is still true, but with the added bonus of some outposts being tied to story progression, meaning key story missions are unlocked, as well as a nice little boost in resistance points when the outpost becomes yours. Those side quests are incentivized further by offering up smaller amounts of resistance points, as well as sometimes a gun or a vehicle to be used later. Leaving outposts as they were, but just adding them to the core progression system was a good move and gives a good reason to seek out the highlights of the series. Unfortunately for Far Cry, combat hasn't always been the most interesting, but one small change to how health worked completely changed how firefights can wind up playing out. Health used to be sectioned off into smaller bars to form a larger one. If health packs were at the player's disposal, one could be used in a quick pinch to go back to full health. Otherwise, a longer animation, often involving removing bullets or resetting bones to get that tiny small bar of health back to help stay alive in the thick of it. All of this has been removed for one static health bar, and no long healing animations exist now. So that leaves Far Cry 5 acting more like a stop and pop shooter waiting for health to regenerate as opposed to getting a quick place to hide while a healing animation plays out then going back right into the shooting stuff. If you're out of health packs you have to stay low behind some cover like every other modern FPS on the market. The only reason I can think of for this change is the reworking of guns for hire. If you're downed you can hold X to cling to life waiting for your partner to come save you. Where this falls apart is how absolutely awful the partner AI and pathfinding is. I think one time I was able to be successfully revived. Otherwise they were killed on the way to me or they got stuck on some piece of environment stopping them from actually getting to me. The only partner I actually wound up using consistently was Nick in his plane. Since there's no environment for him to get stuck on while fighting, he ended up by being the best by default. One thing that has become all too common within major AAA titles is the fear of NPC death. With Far Cry 2's buddy system, if one fell a few too many times in battle, you either had to mercy kill them or they bled out. There was only so much punishment to be taken. If one of your friends falls in battle, a little timer appears above their head. If it runs out, they either die if it's a meaningless nobody, or they are out of action for only 15 minutes before you can call on them again. However, if it's during an important story mission or a character key to the plot outside of a mission, the timer never runs down. It just sits there removing any sense of urgency from battles to go save them. Simply just take your time clearing a zone, then go pull them back to their feet. Given that Far Cry 5 has a less linear way to progress that doesn't even require completing story arcs to get to the end, this could have easily been circumventing by adding more side quests and little things to gather points. I know I complained earlier about having to grind resistance points due to the lack of being able to go through a story mission, but that was the fault of the game's weird spread of animals and not a punishment for letting someone die. In a post Game of Thrones and Walking Dead climate, I think it's fair to say the mainstream is ready for some less plot armor in their games. Alternatively, if an enemy is near death, but not quite there, a red circle will appear above their head acting as a last stand. If you don't take care of them, their friends can pick them up off the ground, putting them back into the action, making you have to make some small on the fly choices in the heat of battle. It's not the biggest change, but it does help switch things up a bit. Hunting animals and gathering plants was never the most interesting part of the previous Far Cry games but it did reward players who went out of their ways to seek them out in small but compelling ways. Kill and gather enough skins of certain animals and you can use them to upgrade different pouches, increasing wallet or ammunition carrying amounts. On the same token, gathering herbs gave different boosts from health replenishers to damage resistance or output. It's not the most dense system and was ruined by how easily towers made it to find everything you needed, but it worked in its own small ways. 5 does away with this to the point that all collection related animations aren't in the game. You just hold a button for a second and the loot is yours. This lack of animations is something I didn't know I'd miss until it was gone. It added to the whole, admittedly small package of the hunter gather aspect that played into 3, 4 and primal. What's more upsetting though, is what is gained from doing these things. Herbs for the most part, with the exception of no more health packs, are the same, offering up temporary buffs when needed. But hunting down animals is now a way to make money, and instead carrying upgrades are relegated to the simple perk system. Since money is so otherwise easily gained from missions, pepper stashes, and just generally looting dead bodies in houses, the need to hunt down animals is completely gone. With the removal of towers and addition of actually having to find out where areas are from road signs to maps, one of the systems that could have benefited most 
surface from this change is completely gutted from its core value. Is this an attempt to slowly wean out the system in future iterations from some focus testing carried out by Ubisoft? Or just an oversight that got lost in development, like forgetting to re-record lines for a different gender? One thing Far Cry has never been known for on a whole as a series is movement. Given the nature of open world games, it seems to be one of the elements that gets left behind. Instead of trying to fix it, fast travel became a quick band-aid to put over this issue, and it was sort of forgotten about. If you want to walk from point to point, there are little stops along the way that can fill your time, but they're basic filler that doesn't really add much. This holds true not only for Far Cry, but just open world games in general. That was until Breath of the Wild came along and added the ability to climb wherever and then parasail down. It's an incredibly simple solution that dramatically raised the bar, so now the shortcomings of boring player movement is even more obvious as a result. And unfortunately, moment to moment movement around Hope County is incredibly boring. Like, so boring that while flying a plane, something I've been waiting to be introduced into the series for a long while, I ended up by having enough safe downtime, I was able to put down my controller and make some quick plunge. What's worse is that when I got back, I was able to sit down and eat it before I reached my destination. Granted, I was moving pretty far across the map, but the point remains, there is absolutely nothing interesting about getting around. On foot, climbing is still dictated by finding either some hanging rope or sections to grab a hook onto. You're not given the freedom to try and fail, it's just button prompted platforming. However, where traversal is consistently fun in 3, 4, and 5 is the wingsuit. That thing that lets you find a high point, jump down, and go for your life weaving in and out of trees and other obstacles. It's the one time going from point to point feels unsafe, but also entirely dictated by you. Messing up a small turn can lead to instant death, making it a controller clutching affair to partake in. The wingsuit is yet another victim of the choose your own path approach though, being relegated to a very small priced perk upgrade. Previously, it was something that was a reward from a pretty fun mission, I mean, it makes sense. Some players could get to the very end of the game before getting their hands on it, making high cliffs god awful to get down from without relying on fast travel. But it's still a shame. Since it has such a low barrier to entry as is, maybe Dutch's Island could have somehow introduced it. But hey, again, it's another small concession that had to be made. That said, like a lot of aspects that have been key to the series since 3, perks have received a small overhaul that changed a lot of how the larger game plays out. You'd kill enemies or complete missions to gain experience points to level up, and then spend some time in different talent trees picking little upgrades to the character. Some only available after completing specific missions as a means to keep more powerful stuff tucked away till later, but as a whole it was tied to level progression. 5 does away with leveling up, which I was incredibly happy to see. If you're familiar with my channel, you know how I feel about experience systems in games like these. So the change was extremely refreshing. Now talent points are dished out for completing challenges, like shotgun kills, skinning different animals, fishing, or looting pepper stashes and outposts. It's a great way to encourage trying out different playstyles and activities to be found around Hope County, incentivizing even the smallest of tasks. If you want to gain more abilities, try more things. I'm just not a fan of how much was given to perk upgrades. Carrying packs and the wingsuit, two things I've previously mentioned, are the biggest losses to the new system. But really, it's a welcome change. Not needing to grind long amounts of time to get some flashy new skill, even in the late game. I can only assume this is, again, another thing the much more open playstyle dictated. How powerful you are is determined by you and not the progress of the story. Something I want to touch on before I finish this video is the moments Far Cry has become incredibly good at. Not the emergent gameplay moments, although given all the systems at play here, those are still cool. Getting attacked by a turkey in the middle of a gunfight was one of the funniest things I experienced. No, what I'm talking about is the scripted ones, like burning down Vars' weed fields as a Damien Marley and Skrillex dubstep song kicks in. 4 has the Opium Factory mission as Punjabi MC's song Jogi plays as RJ loses his mind and starts seeing things. Similar to the towers, 5 splits the drugs and music moments up. It's like Ubisoft realized how much people like these points and decided that's what we wanted. So, now weird and wacky drug induced moments are found everywhere, but especially in Faith's Hembane River, where bliss is manufactured from what I assume is Detura. The link is never explicitly stated, but given how you see Jimson weed in the load screens, it's pretty obvious. I'm assuming this was to avoid drug references that would result in an R18 rating. Plus, bliss just sounds cultish. Big dumb action music moments are here too, and they are awesome. There isn't a shortage of big hit songs blasting as you do cool things in video games. In fact, it's a pretty common place, but god damn does Far Cry always manage to pull it off. Having a giant shootout in a mansion as the vines get free blares out giant speakers. Or Barracuda building while driving a truck with machine guns just feels so empowering. While the tacky drug stuff felt a bit off, the same cannot be said for what they did with music. 
All I can think about when it comes to Far Cry 5 is that it's a game of missed opportunities from escape sequences to partner plot armor. Mainstream games just don't have the breathing room the middle market or indie games have to be as creative as they want. And that's okay, we need big dumb tent poles every once in a while. Even if you're not personally a fan, at the very least they can serve to highlight what everything else does better, helping you appreciate those more creative titles. I don't think Far Cry 5 is a bad game by any means. I had a lot of fun, but it's a product of its own success. My gripes lie with just a few things that had to fall away in order to accommodate this new way to progress. Things that didn't really need to change in the first place, and with just a few tweaks to the formula, like movement, making combat a bit more interesting, and bringing back meaning to hunting and gathering, maybe the next iteration could be a true powerhouse of open world design. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what I do on this channel, please consider subscribing or even checking out my Patreon. Hell, I've got a Discord server if you want to come hang out. I want to give a special shout out to my top tier patrons, and I am so sorry if I mess up your names. Emily Snow, Nicholas Gambarini, Amacy, Hamish Black, Eugenia Wu, Nico Blakely, Mark B. Writing, Maddie Ireland, GC Positive, Zach Rainville, and Jack Mills. Until next time, I'll see you later.